So welcome everyone to our Within Reach webinar. This is a series that we started as a result of COVID-19 and having to move our instruction both for the Deaton Scholars Program and at the university online. This is being recorded as soon as I get the okay from Yanu, our computer guy, this is good. Um, he'll be recording it and posting it to our YouTube channel. Um, so you can all follow that afterwards as well as share it with any friends or people that aren't able to make it today. But as you all know, we have Roger Thoreau with us this evening. And um, I'll let Brady do the honors of introducing him to you all. Holly, thank you. And to everyone, since I'm not sure who's out there completely, uh, this is Brady Deaton at the University of Missouri. And it's a real pleasure for me to be able to introduce this evening one of the most prominent spokesmen in the world for issues of global hunger and food and particularly children and malnutrition in the world today, and that is Roger Thoreau. Uh, Roger is a friend uh, and a colleague who has become tremendously close to a lot of people concerned about these issues in his work. He is currently a, a fellow of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and has also recently become affiliated with Auburn University and their program in universities fighting world hunger. So we welcome him to the professorial ranks as well. Thank you. Uh, as, as many of you know, and some of you have seen Roger and at the World Food Prize, he's been very active with the World Food Prize. Uh, I mentioned the universities fighting world hunger. He's very familiar with the program of, uh, of Deaton Scholars and has been an uh, outspoken uh, uh, spokesperson for us at times. And Roger, we appreciate that. He comes to us after, um, three decades uh, as a Wall Street Journal foreign correspondent. He was stationed in Europe and Africa and began to examine closely the issues of world hunger at that, during that time in his work with the Wall Street Journal. He then uh, began to publish a series of books that have become very prominent and are entering into many uh, curricula of many programs around the country today in universities. Those three books are the, the book Enough, or Why the World's Poorest Starve in an Age of Plenty, and the book The Last Hunger Season, and the book 1,000 Days, which looks at the early life of, of children. And he pre 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 brings a very intimate, close view of families to this issue, and he touches everyone with his words. Roger, we're delighted to have you with us this evening, and I welcome you to our program, and by, by virtually to the University of Missouri. Thank you, Brady. Uh, thanks for the for the very warm and uh, I know heartfelt uh, introduction. Thanks for the friendship, uh, you and Anne, uh, and continuing to invite me to uh, speak and engage with uh, not only the Deaton Scholars but uh, the entire university uh, and uh, through the universities fighting world hunger and other great uh, platforms. So very much uh, appreciate. Uh, that and a great admirer of all the work that that uh, that you have done and you and Ann at the at, at your foundation, uh, and so delighted uh, uh, to be here uh, for that. Thanks for mentioning the books. Uh, those three books I, I the the I call uh, collectively together uh, the Real Hunger Games trilogy. Uh, it's not about hunger in some dystopian uh, sense, but hunger and malnutrition in our world. Uh, in the 21st century uh, and this appalling uh, fact that we brought this medieval suffering of hunger and malnutrition with us into this grand new millennium and into the 21st uh, uh, century. Uh, so thanks for the shout out uh, for the books. You know, I almost uh, attended the University of Missouri uh, back when I was uh, uh, leaving high school or senior in high school in 1975 in Crystal Lake, Illinois, Northwest Illinois. I wanted to study journalism. Obviously, of course, the University of Missouri, uh, a pillar in, in, uh, among the journalism schools uh, at the time, and visited and was talking to the, the, the dean of the J School uh, at the time. And there was such a uh, flood of students in the journalism schools at the time, because it was right at the time of Watergate uh, and the aftermath of that, and everybody wanted to be a journalist and... and uh, uh, to live up our, our, to our noble calling of uh, comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable. Uh, and uh, uh, he said, uh, look, I mean, it's, it's uh, 
Uh, a lot of students are coming in, first priority uh, to Missouri students, um, obviously. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll be kind of limiting participation, both in the journalism courses uh, and then at the, the, the great uh, student newspaper to upperclassmen. So, you know, for the first couple of years, it'd be like, okay, so what will I do for that? And then I, at the, after that, visited the University of Iowa uh, and their journalism program uh, was starting to rise to prominence and uh, so ended up at, uh, at University of Iowa. So that close in coming to uh, uh, Missouri. Um, so it still uh, has a warm spot in my, in my heart. Um, congratulations to all the Deaton Scholars uh, and uh, the, the great program and the great work that you're doing and uh, the path that you're setting yourselves off, off on uh, career-wise, uh, I hope. So keep up the great work. Uh, uh, it's it's um, you know, very wonderful uh, what you're doing and uh, hopefully what you'll be able to accomplish in the fields of international development and particularly on, on the hunger uh, malnutrition and poverty reduction uh, aspects. Uh, and again, so thanks for this opportunity. Uh, and within reach, I mean, your, your, your program, uh, Unlocking a World Without Extreme Poverty and Food Insecurity, extremely uh, important and timely uh, now, particularly with the, the coronavirus uh, uh, rampaging and taking the toll that it is. And as we can see that that is quickly uh, becoming this this health crisis uh, is quickly turning into a global uh, hunger and nutrition uh, crisis uh, as well, especially as the the virus moves and takes starts taking its toll in Africa uh, and India. Uh, we've already seen the havoc kind of in the food system, uh, and even in the United States, uh, that even here this health crisis has become a hunger crisis. When we you know look at the, the the huge and long lines at the at the the, the food banks, the food pantries, uh, the scramble for food, the empty shelves in the grocery stores, the scramble to replace the the lunch and uh, breakfast uh, free meal programs at schools. Not if the schools are closed, uh, these these free meals then not available to children anymore uh, and to the families. So there's great scramble to compensate from them, and so we see kind of the revealing of this, this shameful secret of America, I think, that uh, hunger amidst uh, abundance that we try not to recognize, you know, almost, you know, decidedly try to, to ignore, to not look at, to not see. Uh, but in times of crisis like this uh, or other natural disasters, uh, here it comes to full front again and we can't ignore it. So it's unveiling what I think is this, is this American oxymoron of hung, uh, hungry Americans. These are two words that don't belong together. Uh, so it is true oxymoron, hungry Americans. Uh, and uh, uh, so, you know, really uh, uh, focusing our concentration on that. Uh, so what I'd like to uh, talk about uh, and show a slide presentation, uh, so you don't have to just stare at me, we'll have uh, uh, other interesting people, particularly in Ethiopia, uh, to look at. Uh, and it'll it will basically to look at uh, as this first slide says this this lost chance of greatness to recruit the true cost of mal of childhood malnutrition and stunting and to look at that from a very very human uh, perspective um, and also then in the context and, and remember this that it's it's the childhood stunting and malnutrition that will carry the legacy of uh, the COVID-19 and the coronavirus far into the future. Uh, because as we'll see uh, in, in the slides coming up, that stunted children become stunted adults. Uh, stunting becomes this, this lifelong, this life sentence of underachievement and underperformance that impacts us all. Uh, so, we go back to Ethiopia of 2003 when our story begins, uh, first famine of the 21st century, 14 million people on the doorstep of starvation, most of them children, you're being kept alive by, by food aid and food distribution, a lot of it coming from the United States uh, at the time. So if they're gonna survive at all, it was the, the, the food aid and this, this rallying of humanitarian uh, assistance, uh, particularly to uh, aid the recovery and treatment of 
uh, the children. Uh, and so this that we're going to see now is the story of one of them. And in essence, as we'll see, it then becomes the story uh, of us all. It's the story of Hargirso. It's this five-year-old five year boy, and he weighed just, he's in the center of the screen, weighed just 27 pounds when his father tests fired. His poor smallholder farmer carries him into an emergency feeding tent. And this tent is packed with dozens of children clinging to life, cradled by their, by their parents. As you can see, Hargirso here, you know, has kind of the classic signs of malnutrition, uh, the oedema, the, the, the swelling from uh, protein deficiency, uh, his arms and legs, um, you know, so weak he's being held and propped up uh, between the legs of his father because uh, he can't even basically sit up straight. You can even see his father testify in how thin and, and worn he is. The, you can see the, 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 the rib cage and the collarbone uh, uh, protruding and then the children on, on either side of hard gear, so also in horrible uh, shape uh, at the time. Uh, this was, as Brady was referring to, that uh, hunger, malnutrition, writing about that uh, becomes the central focus of my reporting uh, at this time uh, in, in May 2003, so almost exactly coming up on 17 years ago, uh, when I walked into this emergency feeding tent uh, and really for the first time then uh, was seeing uh, uh, this appalling, awful uh, hunger uh, for the first time in all my reporting uh, career and overseas. Uh, my first day in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, was meeting with the World Food Program that was leading the distribution of the food aid. And uh, one of the um, officers, uh, program directors at the World Food Program, uh, gave me a piece of advice. It sounded like an ominous warning, uh, actually. And he said, Roger, Looking into the eyes of someone dying of hunger becomes a disease of the soul. Because what you see is that nobody should have to die of hunger. Particularly not now, not in 2003. Right at the start of our new millennium, at the beginning of the, at the dawn of the 21st century. What? People are still dying of hunger and starvation? I'm thinking a disease of the soul. What's this guy talking about? You know, you kind of gird yourself, you know, when you go into these, uh, some of these countries um, in many parts of the world. Uh, you know, the yellow fever shot, uh, you know, the malaria medication, watching out for cholera, any outburst of meningitis or something, but a disease of the soul. So the next day, there we were down in the hunger zones. We come up to this, this area uh, with this field that was being filled with these, these emergency feeding tents. We kind of part the flaps of the tent and we walk inside and this is the scene that we found. This tent is packed with dozens of children clinging to life, cradled by their parents. And these are the eyes, Hargirso and Tesfaya. They're the first eyes of, the, of, of, of starving, particularly Hargirso, that I looked into. I was ashamed because I had been a foreign correspondent for so long, you know, based in South Africa, traveling through Africa for many years and had never really focused on the hunger story, on the malnutrition story. It was there in some of my stories, writing about you know, debt relief or the economic toll in Africa, uh, but never really focusing on, on this and the impact of hunger uh, and malnutrition. So Hargirso is maybe beginning to recover a little bit at this stage uh, because of uh, uh, the emergency treatment uh, of the humanitarian agencies uh, that were all there working furiously, including the, uh, the, the local agencies in Ethiopia and the Ethiopian government. But the doctors were telling, uh, and nurses and humanitarian officials were telling Tesfaya, the shock was so great they didn't know if he would survive. Uh, I, as a journalist, uh, usually as a foreign correspondent, I would I would be in a place like this, I would do my interviews, I would write the story, I would leave and I would move on to the next story. This story stopped me cold. I couldn't, when I, when I left the tent, I couldn't, just, I couldn't just leave this story. So this whole notion of, you know, not only what becomes of, of Hargirso and the rest of the children, but what happens to these children when they get off to such a horrible start in life? And what does that mean? 
So my, my soul indeed becomes diseased. It changes my, it becomes this, this, this moment of, 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 of great disruption, a positive disruption actually in my, in my life, the way that I look at things, and also in my career as a journalist. This becomes a story that I need to return to and return to and return to hunger and malnutrition in the 21st century. So it's here, so here, so I'm going to survive. That gnawed at me and bothered me. And so on one trip then back to Africa in, in 2008, as we see here, I checked with the, the World Food Program. Uh, hey, is Hargir Soan Tesfaya, uh, have you heard from them? Are you still working in that area? Even though it was five years afterwards. And they said, yes, we are. And so they then did a little research and then they got back to me and they said, we have found Hargir so and Tesfaya. Uh, and I said, great, I'm on my way. So back to Ethiopia, back to the Bericha Plateau where, where, where this family is, uh, south of, of, of Addis, back to the area of, of where the feeding tents were, is a big market area, the market beginning to bustle again, uh, the feeding tents gone, a hospital uh, kind of growing up in the place where that was, and then further down the road, and there we found Hargirso and Tesfaya. So hooray, Tesfaya survived, or Hargirso survived. That's a great thing. But clearly, he isn't thriving. You can see how small he still is. So the physical stunting, he's 10 years old, certainly physical stunting, still so small compared to his dad. I asked Tesfaya, well, is he going to school? He's 10 years old now, Hargirso. And he said, no, not in school. I don't think he's able for it that he often gets sick. Uh, if he gets a bout of malaria, it's particularly severe because his immune system has been compromised. Uh, yes, he survived, but uh, we see the physical stunting. We see the, uh, uh, the immune system uh, stunted and compromised. And Tesfaya was, was, was just assuming, yes, he probably has cognitive stunting as well. Uh, because it's in that early part of life, particularly in the first thousand day period, from throughout the, the time from when a mom first becomes pregnant, so throughout the mom's pregnancy, through the first two years of the child's life, that first thousand days is so important. And as, as, as I talked to Tesfaya on this trip, so five years later, and then also on the original visit when saw them in the emergency feeding tent, uh, learned from Tesfaya, learned from the mother, when I, Herbert Gerso's mother, when I eventually met her, that yeah, his first thousand days uh, was also particularly uh, bad. Uh, the mother is small, uh, frail, uh, often sick herself. Uh, Tess Fye is a smallholder farmer, had, had annually struggled to feed his family, descending every year into that profound period of deprivation called the, 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 the hunger season. Uh, uh, the time between when the food from the previous harvest runs out and when the next harvest comes in. So meals shrink, uh, food is rationed in the families. You can physically see the, the members of the family uh, shrink uh, physically. Uh, so Hargirso had had, he was certainly uh, malnourished in that time of the first thousand days. Then as a, as a young child, uh, when that famine hits in, in uh, 2003 and he's about five years old, he then becomes the most vulnerable in the family uh, and, and the impact on him is most severe. So there we are, he's 10 years old, physically stunted, and the father assumes cognitively stunted as well. But I'm still wondering, so what, 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 what as the years go by, how is Hargir so doing? So Ethiopia 2003, five years later, I'm back again. I'm beginning reporting on the first thousand days book that is looking at so what happens to children when they get off to such a lousy start in life uh, because of malnourishment, because of hunger? I had just finished uh, reporting the last hunger season uh, book in which I had followed four small holder farmers through the course of a year as they descend into the hunger season in Western Kenya. And from one of the mothers there, one of the, one of the children uh, in, in, in one of the families, he was the youngest one of all the, the children, the families that I was following, little David. He was two years, two and three years old at the time during the, the course of the reporting in that year, and that year was 2011. And little David was manifestly malnourished. He had a distended belly. He had mottled hair. Uh, so losing hair in patches, discolored hair, had a constant cough, persistent cough. 
Um, and so was, was as, as I said, manifestly malnourished. And his mother, Zipporah, she said something that, 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 that I still remember so vividly today. It was a profound statement. And she said that the deepest, from her I came, come, came to understand, as she said, that the deepest form of misery is to be a mother, a father, a parent. To be a mother unable to, to stop in silence the crying of a hungry child. So throughout the reporting of that book then, I was thinking, yeah, so what, what's going to happen to David? Uh, to other children uh, that get off to such a, a horrible start in life, particularly on a nutrition front. And so when I begin then the reporting on that, the first thousand days, uh, that, that will look specifically at the importance of good nutrition and everything that supports it, the water, sanitation, hygiene, all those efforts that support good nutrition. To look at that in the first thousand days, I'm following moms and children through the thousand days in India, Uganda, Guatemala, and Chicago. Chicago is the representation for uh, the richer world and the rich precincts of the world. On my way to Uganda for the first trip and, and visit there for the first thousand days book, I figured, okay, I'll stop in Ethiopia again. That was 2013. So it's 10 years after when I first met them, after the famine in 2003. Hargirso is 15 years old now. The physical stunting is still so manifest. I mean, look at him, how small he is still compared to his father, Tesfaya. Tesfaya is no giant uh, by any means. Uh, and so he's, you know, maybe what, two thirds the size of his father. To me, and I'm about 6'4", he came up to the bottom of my rib cage. Uh, that's how small uh, he was uh, uh, compared to me. But he had a smile on his face, and I said, hey, so hard gear, so, you know, how's it going? And he said, I'm in school. I said, you're in school? And he had a big, yes, I'm in school. And I said, where is it? He says, right down the pathway. So I look at his dad, he says, yeah, it's right over here. Uh, and so Hargirso sort of ran off to school. Uh, I think he was on the morning shift. Uh, back then in school the school was so overcrowded they had you know half the kids came in in, in the morning half came in the afternoon uh, and so our so runs scampers off to school and then we follow him so we get to school and there I find him in the in the classroom big smile on his face he's got his notebooks in front of him and his workbooks he's in the first grade he's just learning the alphabet that day, they were learning the letter B combined with vowels. With vowels. B, ba, bo, bu, bai, at age 15. So you can see, he's writing it for the first time in his book. He's so proud. He's, he's writing for the first time at 15 years old. But he looks the same as all these other children in the class, you know, who are, you know, maybe their first grade would be seven years old, eight years old when they're starting. Maybe some six-year-olds um, in the class. And Hargirso looks like he fits in. And even though he was 15 at the time and one of the oldest, and he wasn't even the oldest in the class, there were still some others that were maybe 16, 17 years old, also impacted by the famine in 2003. The teacher said, yeah, he's, he's an okay student, but he's by no means the best uh, student, even though he had such an age advantage on them. So here you can see the physic, the, the, both the physical stunting and the cognitive stunting, 15 years old, first grade. Continues to be, Hargirso, a prominent part of my thinking through the years. How's he doing? Is he still in school? Is he, is he working at some stage? What's going on? So uh, I keep thinking about him. I'm following Ethiopia. The Ethiopian government, you know, realizing that childhood malnutrition is costing the economy, it's taking a tremendous toll on the economy. 16% of the GDP annually is its calculations, this cumulative impact of childhood malnutrition. Ethiopia makes, it, makes reducing stunting a top national priority. I mean, it had a 58% stunting rate. 58% stunting rate of all children under five years old in the year 2000. We can see then how it comes down by 2016. It's like 38%, so great progress being made. But then it starts leveling off. The progress slows. 37% in 2017. Now it's maybe 36, 
And so they made great progress. And then you get to kind of the stubborn last mile uh, in a sense of how you of how you pursue this. Really making nutrition a top national priority uh, and uh, trying to uh, uh, lower this uh, cost of the uh, uh, the, the the cost to the to the economy. I think they were figuring at that state that yeah that 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 and as I said, stunted children become stunted adults. The adult population that had been that it had been stunted uh, in some manner uh, was 60, 70 percent uh, of the population at that time uh, in the the early part of the the two thousands. And globally, they're also starting to make a push on this. You know, uh, the thousand days movement begins scaling up nutrition uh, movement that is really prioritizing uh, good nutrition in the first thousand day period. That starts coming up in about 2010, 2011, 2012. World Bank starts talking about the cost of human capital, the cost of this cumulative uh, uh, amount. Uh, and so, uh, as we can see, the stunting rates uh, globally then start uh, declining. And now it's about 22%. Uh, so that reduction of 33%, but globally it's also starting to stable and be stabilize uh, and level off in the progress and become that much more uh, tougher to keep, um, uh, to keep advancing. So still we have this, this horrible tragedy and what I think is perhaps the cruelest, most tragic statistic in our world today, reality, is that nearly one in every four children, so 22% under the age of five in our world today is stunted in some manner. And as we're talking about, as I mentioned, it's not confined to childhood. For stunted children to become stunted adults, it's just generational legacy that has profound cost for all of us. And so we can see then that a stunted child anywhere becomes a stunted child everywhere. Uh, you know, stunting is this harsh, horrible, ugly, brusque, rude word, stunting, stunted. The clinical definition of stunting is too short for age, but what is that? How do you, how do you uh, envision that or comprehend that, this true cost of stunting? That's what we see in the embod embodied by, by Herr Gierso as we go through time with him. So this cumulative impact of childhood malnutrition and stunting cost the global economy more than three and a half trillion dollars annually, the World Bank estimates, in diminished cost, lost productivity, and higher health care cost. They figure that for the, I mean, it, the, the impact of stunting is like if you take a, a pebble and you throw it into a placid pond and the stone hits the water and then all these ripples come out. I mean, there's the individual ripple, which we're seeing with Hargirso, the lack of, the lack of education. Uh, first grade, 15 years old. The loss then later in life that's been calculated of maybe 20 to 40 percent less in earnings later in life when, 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 when the, the, again, the stunted child becomes a stunted adult when they're in the workforce, the higher health care cost through the lifetime. Then the next ripple is the impact on the family. It makes it, all those costs and those cumulative costs that, that, that less full wage earning of a child. And if there's one stunted child in the family, there's probably more if there's more children. So it makes for the family that climb out of poverty that much more difficult. The next ripple then, the community as a whole. Look at the labor pool. Less educated, less productive. Same with the, with, with, with the economy of, of, of a nation and how that hinders it. Ethiopia calculating... 16% of GDP, I mean, my goodness. Africa, the, ne the, 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 the next ripple, regions of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, which includes India. These two regions of the world that have been fueling a lot of the economic growth globally over the last number of years. In those regions of the world, the calculations are that the cumulative cost of childhood malnutrition and stunting is about 11% lost of GDP annually every year. 11%, I mean, you wonder why some places in the world remain so poor. It's because their children are getting off to a lousy start in life. And then globally, the, 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 the big ripple, three and a half trillion dollars annually of lost economic activity. It's it, they're huge cost in huge numbers, but the greatest cost 
can't be measured. We see that as we continue to follow Hargearsos progress. So late last year in December, 2019, while we were all still able to travel, we turned to Ethiopia, still wondering what's become of, of Hargearsos. My, my diseased soul propelled me forward to continue to look at this issue. So now Hargearsos is about 21 years old. He's an adult, still shorter than his father. He's still in school. Ah, but now he's in fourth grade. So hooray, he's still in school. But in those five years, he's gone from first grade to fourth grade. That's one of the things, the uh, impacts of stunted malnourished children is that they often have to repeat classes. When they're in class, they're able to comprehend and learn less. So he's still in school. He's now in the fourth grade. But you can see, compared to the other students in class, I mean, still, he seems to fit in, but he's, he's, he's kind of the smallest of all of them. That class has 60 plus students, that fourth grade class. More than half of them, I find out as I talk to the other students in the class, more than half are 18 years old and above. It's a legacy from that 2003 famine. It's the stunted generation. I asked the kids in class, hey, so what would you like to be someday? What are your aspirations? Hand up in the back from a girl, I'd like to be a nurse and help people. Oh, that's great. How old are you? I'm 18. One of the boys in front raises his hand. I'd like to be a doctor. Wonderful. How old are you? I'm 18. A child in the back raises his hand and stands up. I'd like to be an engineer and build things. Spectacular. Great ambitions. How old are you? I'm 15. Hargirso, as I talked to him, and this time and then over the years, you know, he's told me he'd like to be a doctor, again, to help people, or a businessman or a teacher. This day, he's learning simple math the entire class at age 21. The others in the class, the, the, the ones who are 18, the, the boy who's 15 and wants to be an engineer, are they going to be able to achieve their goals, their aspirations? Probably not if they're just learning simple math if they're in fourth grade at those ages already. The impact of cognitive stunting. So we see that stunting is a life sentence of underachievement. And we've got to ask ourselves, what might a child have accomplished for all of us? Not only for the family or for the neighbor, the community or the country or the region. What would they have accomplished for all of us? Were she or he not stunted? Imagine those lost opportunities. It's a poem not written or a song not sung or a novel, a novel not imagined a mystery not solved, a horizon not explored, an idea not formed, an inspiration not shared, an innovation not nurtured, a cure not discovered. I mean, imagine of all the people in the world that are working on a cure for the coronavirus and COVID, all the scientists that are, that are at work on them, how many have we taken out of that equation of potential people trying to help us all by finding the cure, by finding it, by developing a vaccine, if a quarter of the children are stunted and they become stunted adults. My goodness, what are we doing to ourselves? This lost chance of greatness for one child becomes this lost chance of greatness for us all. So that's the human dimensions of childhood stunting and malnutrition. It's not just children under five, although that's the measurement, that cost is carried over time. So what's wrong with us? Why do we tolerate this? Ending stunting stands as one of our great, greatest and most achievable challenges. It is, it is within reach, which you're all pondering. This is supposed to be the decade of nutrition, hoping you know, uh, investments increase, and they have. It's now maybe you know, four billion annually that's being invested both by local governments, the national governments of the world, by, by, by donors, uh, the World Bank, the Gates Foundation, a whole bunch of people that are putting money into this. But it's still kind of short of what's needed. That's why the stunting rates are now stubborn. The wasting rates of children, uh, severe underweight. Anemia is on the rise all over the world, including in the United States. Do you want to call to wax? I mean, it's time to raise the clamor to create this give a damn. 
motivated by this, 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 this realization that this lost chance of greatness for one, it's a cost too great for all of us. So that's my message today. This is from this diseased soul of mine uh, to as we look at things that are within reach and unlocking a world without extreme poverty and food security, stunting childhood malnutrition, that's got to be a top priority. Uh, if we conquer that, if we eliminate that, how much better it is for all of us, and particularly this opportunity cost. If we eliminate that, boy, all these things that open up to us. So thank you. Happy to take any questions to have a uh, discussion. Uh, I'll stop sharing. Uh, Holly, can we do that? Yep. I, do that? Um, I don't know if I can stop your sharing. Oh, there. I there see we you. go. Perfect. Okay, so we will start by a few of the questions that were submitted in advance and then open it up to questions from the audience if you still have time. Um, one of the questions that we received over and over was about food insecurity in light of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So how can we solve the increased food insecurity problem that is caused by this pandemic? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm sorry for rambling on too much. Uh, during the slides, I always tell people, don't get me started. Uh, because, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I, it, it's, again, as you can see, it's become a passion of my journalism. Uh, I think resilience is something that's really important, particularly for all the farmers of the world and, and especially for the smallholder farmers uh, of the world to create the conditions so that these farmers, no matter where they are and the size of them, so that farmers all over the world can be as productive as, as possible. Uh, particularly the smallholder farmers. I mean, we're going to see the, the hopefully not, but I, I, I fear and many other people, you know, sounding the alarms already of what the impact of, of COVID-19, particularly then with this double whammy of this other great plague uh, that's in Africa, the locusts. I mean, Ethiopia, it's now the second swarm that's starting to come through uh, Ethiopia and, West, and, and other parts in East Africa. Uh, so it's kind of this 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 double plague that's uh, uh, that's assaulting them, and other you know crop diseases that may be out there. So it's as resilient as they as they can become uh, to uh, prioritize uh, spending on nutrition. Nutrition has been so long neglected by the international development community. I mean, at one stage it was like less than one percent of all development spending was on nutrition. Even though we know that, that that nutrition, we see it in our Gearso story, it is the, the cornerstone, it's the foundation of all development efforts, you know, and the efforts on, on, on the wash issues, on, uh, on education, on any infrastructure uh, issues. Nutrition, particularly in the first thousand days in, a child, in, 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 in childhood, is so vital uh, and important, uh, good nutrition. So prioritizing nutrition, increasing investments, uh, and really focusing on particularly the smallholder farmers, how do they become more resilient? Uh, the, 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 the indigenous crops uh, that they grow, that the, 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 the making sure that the crops are more nutritious, uh, uh, not just calories, but, but, the, but the nutrients. Uh, so prioritizing this, being cognizant of it, particularly that this is a huge cost. It's, it's not just something over there somewhere. It's something that happens to all of us. It's a problem right, right in front of us. Uh, Hargirso is not just in Ethiopia. The impact of him can be felt uh, here as well. So, Perfect. And one more question that we had submitted. Um, you mentioned Hagirso in that answer. What would be the most significant programs that we should support to support people like him in the world? Uh, so there's some that I, I wrote about in the first, thou in the first thousand days book. Um, this program by Harvest Plus. I know many of you uh, know that. Uh, so maybe studying that it's the the process of biofortification, conventional breeding. So GMO is not involved in it at least at this stage uh, of raising the nutrient content that's in crops already, and and raising that to to increase the the level of uh, vitamin of of nutrients that are already in those crops. So uh, high iron beans. Beans have have a level of iron in them. You through breeding you increase the the iron content. Uh, the uh, the protein content, the vitamin A content of uh, of, of orange plus sweet potatoes, uh, for instance, of of millet, of cassava, uh, all these vital vitamins and nutrients uh, that are already in the crops to kind of raise them uh, up through that. Uh, so that's one one program. Uh, you know, we see kind of any programs that then lead to uh, 
uh, increasing agriculture development. So the Global Food Security Act, uh, that is a rare act of Congress that actually passed, I think it passed unanimously. So bizarre, you know, bi bipartisan support on the Global Food Security Act um, that originally comes out of the Obama administration and Feed the Future uh, to uh, uh, make sure and prioritize uh, and to increase government uh, attention and spending uh, on agriculture development uh, issues. Because the, the, the more that these smallholder farmers succeed and the more resilience that they have, then the better off um, we all are. Kind of any programs that uh, uh, increase uh, nutrition, nutrition uh, education, nutrition awareness, uh, particularly in the first thousand uh, days period. And then as we're seeing now, the importance of the WASH programs, the water sanitation hygiene. When I was reporting this in Uganda and fo following children in Uganda in the first thousand days, you know, it was staggering. I think it, I think it was like, uh, like, like the percentage was like in single digits of families in Uganda that had access to soap uh, and, and water and ready access to water that we're all learning how to wash our hands or being, you know, seeing, seeing all sorts of methods uh, to wash our hands. Well, I mean, for, I think it's like, I've seen numbers like maybe 3 billion people in the world, they don't have ready access to soap uh, and, and running water and a faucet in their houses. Uh, so what are they supposed to do? So all this then becomes, becomes so important. Awesome. So now we're going to turn it to the audience. Um, anyone that would like to ask a question, I just put this in the chat. We did get a few last minute chatted um, questions, but you are all more than welcome to ask them yourself. If you know how to raise your hand on Zoom, um, <laughs> do that and we can unmute you. If you don't know how to do that, just chat at me and I'll unmute you. Um, one question I did see was from Mark Morgan. So Mark, let me find you. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you and do your video so that you can ask your question. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. I didn't know I was going to do it live. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> That's great. Well, you addressed some of the answer already, uh, but um, I was curious about the key nutrients and uh, either vitamins or chemical compounds needed to prevent or reverse the effects of stunting. You did mention something about uh, um, iron, protein, and vitamin A. Are there other things that might be uh, considered to be essential? Uh, yeah, great question. Uh, it's, it's basically the whole run of uh, the minerals. Uh, you know, zinc is, is, is incredibly uh, important. Uh, folic acid, uh, you know, in, 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 in the United States, I mean, so it, it's uh, uh, the pregnant women are taking, you know, making sure they have enough iron folic yes. acid in their diets and the pills and the supplements that they can take. Uh, for that, that's missing in so many diets uh, uh, around the world. Uh, vitamin A, uh, vitamin D, vitamin B, kind of the whole alphabet of vitamins uh, are, are also so critical. I mean, vitamin A, uh, both for you know cognitive development, uh, for eyesight uh, that we all know about, um, you know, the, the 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 vitamins, the nutrients that help increase the immunity and the immune and strengthen the immune system uh, in children. Uh, are so important. Um, I would defer to uh, um, kind of any 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 doctors or anybody on the medical side. Uh, I'm a journalist, so my knowledge comes from from interviewing people and saying, "Hey, so what are the important vitamins and minerals mm -hmm. uh, and nutrients uh, that are needed?" So in the first thousand days book, I go through uh, a number of them, and a number of them are supplemented. Um, and 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 really interesting that kind of in in parallel or in tandem to a lot of these supplement uh, programs. So there's vitamin A supplement programs by, by Vitamin Angels, uh, by the Micronutrient Initiative, uh, by many USAID supported programs, where the children in a lot of these really remote um, villages, they line up and twice a year they'll get the vitamin, uh, the vitamin A supplement, which might be a little capsule or it's a little couple of drops uh, that they take. And then what I've recently seen them doing, they then move to another line where they then get deworming medicine. Because it turns out there's, there's certain parasites, there's certain uh, 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 worms uh, that are in the system, and they, specific, they, they target specific vitamins and minerals. So if you're, taking, if you're just taking the, uh, the, vit the vitamin A supplements, 
but you don't have the deworming program, which is also twice a year, right next to it or supplementing it, you're not getting the full impact uh, that you would, would have. That's why the water sanitation uh, hygiene uh, programs are also so important and have to run parallel uh, to the good nutrition because otherwise that undermines uh, every, everything. So on the nutrition front, you want the, the, the proper nutrients in the body and you want them to stay there. If you get cholera or dysentery uh, or waterborne diseases, uh, that then all comes flowing out of the, the body through uh, diarrhea uh, uh, and other complications. And so that all has to come and work uh, together. So that I learned early on in my reporting. It was a big kind of eye-opening uh, uh, thing for me that I should have known about it the more I thought about it, was that I started looking at, ah, here's the importance of nutrition in the first thousand days and all these vitamins and minerals and the education for the moms and the families and the dads to know about what was, it, what, what was important to eat, where, where they can get these vitamins and minerals, what kind of foods, so the education being so critical. But then I realized, oh, that without kind of all these other development aspects, the water, sanitation, hygiene, uh, the infrastructure, the good governance, that without that in place, the nutrition gains can so easily uh, uh, fall apart and go in reverse. Uh, so it's kind of this whole package that, that we have to look at uh, uh, kind of everything together. So stop being siloed in our approach to international development, but basically go across the whole uh, spectrum and realize that that's important uh, uh, for everybody. Uh, is there such a thing as uh, reversing the stunting effect or is this only a myth? No, you, I, you can. Uh, there's certain, there certain aspects that... that uh, uh, is, are really difficult um, to reverse, uh, even you know, with um, you know the proper nutrients. I think you know, depending on, on at what stage it is in a child, uh, the growth, uh, how severe the stunting was, that suddenly if they're in a position that they can have uh, uh, the, the a more diversified diet uh, where you get the vitamins uh, and the minerals uh, and this more well-rounded diet. Uh, you can reverse some of the impact, uh, particularly the physical uh, impacts of it, uh, but the cognitive impacts are really, uh, um, some of that is there to stay because the brain is growing most actively uh, and expansively in that first thousand day period. So even by the time a child is born, uh, so what's develop what's happening in the womb with the, with the development of the brain and these, these, these critical executive functions that we all use every second of the day, uh, you know, be it uh, the, the kind of the reading skills or the language skills or the math skills or the problem solving skills, you know, the emotions of, of, of empathy, of sympathy, all these things of, of, of reacting to, to events around us, that's all basically cresting. If you kind of look at these, the, 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 the brain and neural development charts, uh, yeah, by the time a child is born and certainly in the first months of, of, of life. And so any kind of severe lack of development of, of those functions, which are all fueled by proper nutrition, uh, that's really hard to reverse, uh, you know, as we see. Uh, and uh, so David, the boy that I was, uh, had, had, had mentioned in the first thousand days book and his mom uh, and this, 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 you know, deepest form of misery. Uh, when I went back and, and I've seen him several times afterwards, um, he seems to be doing better. I think they, 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 the, the, the diversity of the crops, uh, the mom, Sapporo, was really concerned about uh, this. Uh, she got on the case uh, early, uh, and even though he was manifestly malnourished, uh, he's now you know, looking much better. So physically, uh, he's not that far in school yet, so we'll see as time goes on uh, with that. So hopefully that in that case, we'll, we'll see that, yeah, David... Uh, uh, was able to recover from his early malnutrition. Okay, I have another person who would like to ask a question. Um, Sadvik Cannon, let me unmute you. Yeah. yeah you question, should be able to speak. Yeah, my question is, how does food insecurity vary between rural and urban regions? I believe that uh, rural America makes food for the urban areas. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. And that, that's the thinking that, well, it's kind of in the rural areas where the food grows uh, and ends up being shipped off to the, uh, to the urban areas. 
but the, 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 what I found particularly in the, the reporting, well, in the reporting uh, uh, when I was still at the Wall Street Journal, but then while doing the last hunger season book and spending all that time with the smallholder farmers, you realize that, that perhaps the cruelest irony in our world today is that, and particularly in, in Africa, is that you know, the world's hungriest people are farmers. And Africa's hungriest people are her smallholder farmers. So, which creates this hideous, uh, awful, uh, obscene oxymoron of hungry farmers. How can farmers be hungry? Because they get up every day to grow food. And a lot of times in Africa, I mean, they take a couple of steps out of their little houses and they're in the fields. Uh, so it's that close, it's that, they're, they're that intimate to the, to the land and to their crops. And that so many of them go through this hunger season, this period of profound deprivation. Um, that, that I think is, is, yeah, one of the, as I said, one of the cruelest you know, ironies and, and, and oxymorons uh, that we have. That's globally. And then in our country, in the United States, I mean, we see, as I said, our, our oxymoron is hungry Americans. Uh, those two words don't go together. Same as hungry farmers. What? How can Americans be hungry? It's the r richest country in the world, the greatest, you know, richest soils in the world, greatest technology uh, uh, on, on agriculture in the world. Uh, what? How are people in, 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 in how, how are there hungry Americans? A lot of that hunger, a lot of that food insecurity is in our rural areas. Uh, and some of the, some of the, 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 the deepest poverty, uh, the deepest food insecurity that are in rural uh, counties. And that's what we're seeing now uh, uh, come up. I mean, the COVID virus, it, 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 it will then also uh, exacerbate you know, the poverty, the hunger, the food insecurity uh, in the urban areas, but then also so much uh, that's coming in the rural areas and the rural pockets of our country. And we see, I mean, this hungry farmers notion in oxymoron also is true here. Uh, as we hear the stories coming out of uh, uh, rural America and the farms and the, 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 the shape that the farmers are in, uh, you know, be it because of lost markets or collapsing prices, uh, dairy farmers going out of business, uh, kind of left and right in Wisconsin and, and some of the other big dairy states. Uh, so it's, it's a global phenomenon and is, is certainly hitting us right here at home too, that the, the, the rural hunger, the rural food insecurity. Okay, and I think we're a little close on time, so I'm going to leave the last two questions to Doctors Brady and Ann Deaton. They've been frantically asking questions away in the chat. And so Ann raised your hand, actually, even so. Yeah, Ann's ready to go, so I will unmute both of you, and you have the final word. Okay, um, I really have a million questions. Let's see which two. Um, uh, I wanted to know if you've had a chance to look at the issue of hunger in um, refugee camps and kind of related to that is what percentage or maybe not percentage what but what portion of the problem about hunger and extreme poverty that continues in countries of low income is due to government corruption and and civil strife uh, within those countries that um, that that really fight all of the know-how that we have nutritionally, et cetera, agriculturally to solve hunger. Yeah, thank you, Ann. Uh, and again, thanks for all your, your great work with Brady. Keep it up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I've spent some time in the refugee camps uh, and then also particularly looking at it from the, from the hunger side. Uh, again, the, the, the tragedy uh, or exacerbated tragedy in a lot of the refugee camps is that the people who are in there are farmers. Uh, because when, and you, you, you mentioned conflict, you know, where are the conflicts? Uh, they're a lot of times in the rural areas. It's those areas that then end up getting, you know, laced with landmines uh, right. in Cambodia, in Mozambique, in Angola, uh, you know, in, in, in Sudan, in, in Darfur. It was the farmers that were being driven off the land uh, because hunger was being used as a decided tool and weapon uh, in, in the conflict uh, by the governments uh, themselves. Uh, by the paramilitaries, which are probably directed by the the, the governments, uh, and so uh, so all the, your, both the, the the questions and aspects that you that you ask are, are really linked uh, together. So then it was a matter of okay, so what do you do in the in the refugee camps? Uh, and if a lot of them are farmers and those skills, can you have kind of growing projects uh, uh, in the areas? 
uh, as opposed to just uh, yeah uh, feeding them. So the World Food Program, you know, the world's uh, the UN agency, the largest you know humanitarian relief agency in the world. Uh, they become very active over the years, uh, you know, and a number of our of, of, of you know the WFP directors in the past are, are you know close colleagues and, and friends of ours, uh, of all of ours, uh, you know, and just talking to them. That was one of the things that okay, just instead of distributing food, how do we how do we you know become uh, also an agency that uh, can also impact uh, the production uh, of the food. Uh, the the more nutritious aspects of the food, the targeting the food, like school feeding programs uh, and things, and so and and so that, that's also then a consequence in the refugee camps and the the, the, tr the tremendous amount of children that are there. Well, if they were in schools in in a number of countries in Africa or or Asia uh, and Latin America, they might be in school feeding programs. Uh, so just as in our country, all these children now, the schools closed, well, they were on the school lunch and breakfast programs. Um, in, in a lot of the other countries of the world, the only time that they'll get the, the, the kids might, their only hot meal of the day might come while they're in school. Uh, so if there's no schools, what do they do? Uh, and it was a big relief for the parents. It's one reason why the parents would even send their kids to school uh, in Africa as well. At least they get one meal. Uh, in school, and maybe sometimes they actually bring home bring home some food. There's a food distribution that goes that goes with it, um, and so all of this then, yeah, kind of uh, you know impacts uh, itself. But in the refugee camps, yeah. So what can we one do to with kind of the the, the instincts and the abilities of the farmers uh, that are there to create some kind of agricultural uh, mechanism, uh, get them back to being uh, uh, productive. And also the, the wash issues of great concern in the refugee camps. And then, yeah, the corruption, the strife, the conflict. Uh, you know, before the, 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 the coronavirus and the locusts and now the warnings of the World Food Program, that, my goodness, you know, it's, what, another 260 million people that they may end up, uh, you know, having to feed that are added to the hunger rolls. Uh, you know, kind of doubling uh, the numbers of, of, you know, to, to kind of back into the, you know, up over a billion people chronically hungry and going to bed again, uh, going to bed at night to reach those numbers again. Um, you know, that before this, the great amount of, 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 of contributions to the, to the rising hunger numbers or, or the hunger numbers as they were, were because of uh, conflict. Uh, and, you know, you can point to a number of areas of the world. Uh, so Yemen, Sudan, Somalia, uh, where there's also failed states that lead to corruption. Uh, and so it's always, uh, you know, yeah, kind of which comes first, hunger, mm -hmm. uh, starvation uh, leads to conflict, but conflict also causes it. It's also the, the result of, of conflict. And so, yeah, those then were, were certainly two of the top priorities that how do we restrict and, and limit the, the, the conflicts uh, uh, in the world. And yeah, then corruption kind of going hand in hand, uh, you know, with that uh, as well. And yeah, just seeing food that's meant for people, for the, for the general population uh, being taken by the governments, uh, by the military uh, folks. Uh, I know the World Food Program tries to limit that as much as possible. Uh, we don't want any of that to happen, uh, you know, but it does. And then the issues where hunger is used as a weapon of, 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 of repression, of dominance, of, of war. Uh, and yeah, that, that has been a leading cause and that just also needs to stop. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. This is wonderful. Thank you. Brady has a question. Roger, yeah, thank you too. And uh, you mentioned the Global Food Security Act a few minutes ago. And over your career, you've seen a lot of evolution in our international assistance programs but they've all required a very strong bipartisan coalition to keep them going. In the kind of divided America that we see today, you see that coalition continuing. And is there anything we should be alert to in that process? Yeah, I mean, great question, Brady. I mean, we can always kind of, no matter what we're doing, uh, is, is constantly raised a clamor about this issue. It's an election year to press everybody on this issue. So what are you doing uh, about this? And, and this, I mean, tragically, but it really brings this issue to the fore of, 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 of hunger in America, 
uh, uh, the, the nutritional aspects uh, of it, what's becoming to our own children uh, uh, through this, uh, that, that issue is at the fore and in front of us. So again, it's not something to be dismissed of, oh, that's something that's happening over there. No, it's front and center uh, to us. But Brady, you see this, I mean, the encouraging sides, but I think this administration every year has uh, in its budget eliminated the McGovern Dole school feeding program. The school feeding programs in many parts of the world and the U.S. funding for that feel that they want to eliminate and scrap for kind of whatever bizarre reasons that they would have. They said, well, we don't see the proof that it works. Uh, no, the, <laughs> the proof is that there's all sorts of people you can ask about, does it work? Yes, it works. Um, but that never goes through. I mean, Congress always says, particularly, you know, the, the, the congressional delegations from the states of Kansas, where Bob Dole is from, and South Dakota, where McGovern was from, they're like, no, Kind of over our dead bodies is, are those programs being eliminated because they 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 are a testament to what America does uh, and has done so so, uh, mm -hmm. so boldly uh, and the leadership that has come from the U.S. government uh, from the time of say you know even before World War II but certainly since the Marshall Plan you know the reconstruction the rebuilding of of, of Western Europe at least after the war the first pillar the first action on that was to prevent hunger in that first winter. Uh, after the war in in Western Europe, um, and uh, so since then it's been American leadership from that. But I think that's one of the points that certainly the Chicago Council, so many organizations, um, you know, and that you guys have been on the front lines on as well, is to keep you know reinforcing that point that this is what America does. This is where American leadership has had such profound impact. Uh, around the around the world, and when you talk to people around the world, that's the thing that's that 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 they remember. I mean, how many times have we been in in say villages in Africa, and you know, people they remember those 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 bags of of food or the seeds that they gotten from USAID and that logo of kind of hand, you know the interlocking hands uh, and the shaking of hands that 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 is something that's kind of you know uh, profound in the, the the thoughts and memories of people around the world so the the global food security act yeah that basically passes unanimously again well this is something we should do. who's opposed to this right i mean who's for hunger uh, sometimes you wonder uh and you see things you say well that's like a really weird uh position for people to be taking uh but there seem to be enough people that are uh you know, still champions uh, for the for the for for the hungry and the malnourished uh, around the world, and so hopefully that maintains. I mean, uh, we also see kind of in in, in the the U.S. programs, the SNAP, the the supplemental uh, nutrition uh, program, the food stamps, uh, the WIC program, women, infant, children. You know, constant attempts. You know, by somebody who raises this in the administration, or somebody in Congress pops up and says, "Oh, we gotta we gotta eliminate you know SNAP. We gotta change SNAP." put in work rules uh, around it, uh, you know, but there is enough, uh, you know, momentum or there's enough people and voices that say, no, we can't do that. Uh, that would be disastrous and, and horrible. And now we see whatever changes that were, they were going to introduce to the SNAP, that's all been put on hold as long as the coronavirus is here. And then hopefully because one now is awake to, my goodness, all this hunger in America, this shameful secret of ours, this oxymoron is now out in play, that hopefully that, that will resonate with people and, and people will remember that uh, and say, no, we can't, we, can't, we can't have that. These are fundamentally important programs for us. And you think about the thousand days, again, it's not just over there, which is why I included Chicago and Moms in Chicago in the book, that this is so fundamentally important for us as well, that our children get off to the best start in life uh, as, as possible. Uh, you know, for, for, for their education, for the, for the betterment of our, of our families and our communities. Uh, because, you know, these thousand days, it's the most important time in individual uh, development. So the strengthening of good physical uh, uh, growth, cognitive development, strengthening the immune system. And by extension, it's the most important time and period for the develop for the healthy and strong growth and development of our families and our communities and our nation as the world is, and and the world as a whole. So, yeah, hopefully there's still enough champions out there that'll make sure that uh, uh, there's at least not too much erosion on this front. Thank you, Roger. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you, Holly. Is Holly, that... are you still? Yep, still here. <laughs> Lindsay's okay. Applauding. Okay, so that's good. Yeah, <laughs> I'm still alive. Um, 
Great presentation. Thank you so much for being with us today. You spent so much of your evening with us and I know I learned a lot. So thank you again for joining us virtually. I sent some links from Roger in the chat, but we will also be posting that on our social media over the next few days. So you're welcome to check out any of his books um, and some other things that he has um, to share with all of you. But we will continue to have webinar series throughout the month of May. So please follow us at the Deaton Scholars Program and the Deaton Institute for more information.